Okie dokie. Welcome. So uh, if you are new to persistent identifiers, this is the session for you. So we're going to run through a beginner's guide. And this guide was put together by um, the crew at Pinapalooza, the team. And uh, we've been running this in different languages as well, uh, the PIDS 101 sessions. And we hope it will give you, um, you know, just an orientation to what are persistent identifiers and how can you use them. So to kick it off, um, let's go to the next slide. I'm gonna I'm toggling between slides at the moment, so give me a little chance. So, what is a persistent identifier? So, persistent identifiers have two main attributes. So, first, they're persistent, obviously, which means they're intended to be around, if not forever, then for a very, very long time. And secondly, they're unique. So you can use the same name to identify two different people or two different things, and one person or thing can have more than one name. But a PID is a unique identifier, one that's used only for one person or thing, even if they have lots of different names or those names change or get abbreviated. A third quality that we here at Pitabalooza think is critical for PIDs is that they are open, or at the very least, the metadata connected to them is open. So openness enables anything or anyone to have, use and share their PIDs for everyone's benefit. And so we will talk more on that later. Okay. So we can have PIDs for places and things in the research community. So there are PIDs for people. Um, so researchers have uh, different types of identifiers available to them. ORCID is probably the most widely known, but also ISNIs. Um, we have PIDs for places like research organisations, and that includes GRID, um, which is a product of digital science, and RAW, the research organisation registry, which uh, is, was started as a mirror of the grid uh, database and is really has a different sort of governance structure around it to what grid does. And there's also PIDs for things like research outputs and inputs such as grants, reviews, preprints, projects, all kinds of things. Um, and some of the PIDs that are assigned to those are uh, DOIs from the Crossref agency so that's for things like articles and grants and and so forth and data site who issue dois for data and gray literature we also have igsns which is a sample identifier we have raids which is an identifier for, for projects and quite a lot more as well so this gives you a little bit of an idea about how pids have evolved over time so uh, the original kind of I guess description for PIDs is a persistent identifier is a long lasting reference to a digital resource. Well, actually let's unpack that a little bit. Um, now we wanna know a bit of provenance information. So what's what and who's, who's who is actually part of the persistent identifier. We wanna know how, how do we know? How do I know it's persistent? Um, how long is long lasting? You know, where are the policies and guarantees around PIDs? What about the machine readability? Where can my machine find this information? Uh, where can I find it? Um, and also we want to know more about it. Can you tell me more about the resource, which isn't just digital. Uh, you can have a persistent identifier that um, is assigned to samples, for example, which is a physical sample collected during the course of research. So we want to know who and what that resource is. So what can PIDs do and why are they important? Well, first of all, they're very good for disambiguation and this is very useful. It, I guess a lot of you would be familiar with ORCID and the ORCID concept. Um, so here we have a record here for Robin Dazzler who has actually got a, a, a few of, she's actually, okay, well that's confusing, also known as Dazzler Howard. So she's got sort of a perhaps a married name and post-married name or pre-married name um, and is known by all these different things. And you want to be able to say that this person is the same person who wrote these articles, who produced these data, who got these grants, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And we do that by assigning an ORCID, so one persistent identifier that resolves to a page of information about that particular person. 
Um, so PIDs are also good for linking. So in an ORCID record, you actually link the person with their works. So not just articles, but also the data they produce um, and the grants that they're connected to and all kinds of things can be linked through your ORCID. So as I said, that's, that's to make sure that this person is the person who wrote or co-authored these particular things or was involved in this particular research. They also enable interoperability. So we want machine to machine exchange of information and PIDs are very good for that because machines can go in and get that information. There's uh, also metadata that's collected with a lot of PIDs and the machines can actually go in and read some of the metadata that's associated with a PID and pull that information in and use it in all kinds of different ways. And um, in this record here, we have the little icons here for Crossref and RAW. We have it for RAID, the ORCID identifier as well. And there's one there for data site. So a lot of different PIDs, um, but all of which um, enable interoperability. So PIDs also help make research fair. So most of you would be familiar with the concept of fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it's a set of principles that was uh, published uh, in uh, an article was published in Nature about that back in 2016. And now we have the Fair Data Principles, which you can find on the Force 11 website that explain um, why we need to make research fair, particularly research data. And PIDs are a sort of, they have a starring role in the Fair Principles, actually. So it's mentioned in a number of places here. You know, if you want the data to be accessible, they need to be retrievable by their identity identifier using a standardized communications protocol um, identifiers here metadata clearly and explicitly include the, the identifier of the data it describes etc so they do feature very strongly in helping make research data fair because they do enable those things um, so PIDs also support a trustworthy research infrastructure so if you click on a link and it resolves to page not found, then that's very frustrating. The link's broken and it's annoying. And it's annoying if you're looking for something, you know, on the web at, you know, eBay or somewhere like that, or Amazon or whatever you're looking at. But in the context of research, it's actually really quite disastrous because you've cited something in your research and somebody can't actually find that thing anymore. So maybe you've said, I found the cure to cancer and here's the link to my data and someone clicks on it, it says page not found. Um, so that's actually quite detrimental and I can't really trust then what you've actually said in the paper. I want to be able to see that and PIDs enable that trustworthiness um, because they enable those things to be persistently resolved to. Um, and in the context of research, that's it's really critical to have trusted, trustworthy research infrastructure. Um, so it's a good start, but we also want more. So connecting everything reveals the true power of persistent identifiers. So this little um, snippet here is a view of the PID, what we call the PID graph. Um, so this is where each of these different entities or objects in research, there's like people, so authors, there's organisations like institutions here, there's publications and data sets and software. Each of those things, if they have a persistent identifier assigned to them, which they should, because if we're moving towards open science and open research, then having these things open and persistently available is really important. So you assign them uh, PIDs to them, and then you can actually query that information so much easier um, and more efficiently, and you can pull out the relationship between those objects, which is really, really important. If you think about it, say, from an institution's point of view, you can say, give me, you know, all, give me this publication. Now give me all the authors attached to that and the institutions that they're attached to so that you can actually see your collaborators in a really visual way. You can say, give me all the data that was a result, you know, of this publication. Uh, you can have software in there, you can have projects as well. So show me all the projects like this and all the data connected to them, etc. cetera. Um, so that's really shows to me the real, the true power of PIDs is where they're connected and uh, just that really rich information that we can theory there about the relationships between um, entities and outputs of research. 
So here's a sort of slightly closer up view of that. So to mention that PIDGRAPH actually came out of the Freya project, which is a European project. Uh, it's coming up, wrapping up or has wrapped up at the moment. However, there's some very good videos that they put out about PIDGRAPH that you can see on YouTube that are only about four or five minutes that really give you a sense for the really great thing that's come out of that project in, the, in, this, in this aspect. So here is an example of how you would query that. So who are all the co-authors of a given researcher? So you can have a look at the person and institution and recorded there if you have an ORCID and a RAW for those things. Then you can have a look at the works which have assigned identifiers from Crossref or maybe, maybe Emble ABI and data site, people and institutions associated with it. Another query might be show all data sets funded by the European Commission that have been cited by a journal article. So you can query those things in through through the PID graph. And PID graph really works well if everybody has assigned PIDs to those um, researchers, entities and outputs of research. So PIDs for almost anything. Um, here are some examples. We have ORCID, um, which mentioned as a, an identifier for researchers that connects them with their research works. And I think uh, most people are familiar with ORCIDs. We have DataCite. Um, so DataCite is a, a DOI registration agency for um, data and grey literature. We have RAW, the Research Organisation Registry, a community-led project to develop an open, sustainable, usable and unique identifier for every research organisation in the world. That's a very um, big, lofty goal that they have there, but they're well underway to moving in that direction. And you can see an example uh, record showing the California Digital Library record there. Um, so if you want to go in and have a look at RAW, you can uh, go to the raw.org website to have a look at it. Also, Crossref is another player in the PID space and a very big one. Um, they issue DOIs for scholarly literature um, and a range of other services associated with that. So both Datasite and Crossref offer services on top of just the issuing of the persistent identifiers. And if you want to find more about that, you can go to their websites um, or also have a look at the YouTube channels where you'll find a lot more of um, information about that. So how can you be a PID person? Because we all want you to be PID nerds. If you're not already, you know, you've joined the party. So come on board as a PID nerd. We've got plenty of room. We know there's like over a thousand people registered for Pitapalooza. And uh, usually in person, we get around the 150 mark. Um, because it's it's in some remote location somewhere in the world, somewhere exotic. But now you have the chance to attend and to really come on board as a PID nerd and we'd really love, it, love to have you join us. Um, so what can you do? Well, first of all, you can get and use PIDs. That's, that's a pretty obvious start. So you can get an ORCID for yourself if you haven't got one already. And don't forget, it's not just about the getting of the ORCID. It's also about the assigning of the work. So make sure that you've got your, your links um, You've done your assertion, so you have linked in your record, uh, your ORCID record, what works you're associated with. You can assign DOIs to your data, software, grey literature. There's the guide from the data site org if you want to um, have a look at how to do that if your organisation isn't doing that already. And um, you can put your reports and white papers into a, into a repository that gives out PIDs as well. Um, so many institutional repositories are hooked into DataCite to be able to issue those DOIs automatically um, and repositories can integrate through that interop interoperability aspect with different PID providers to be able to provide those things. You can also tell your PIDs um, about your other PIDs. So include relevant related PIDs in the metadata for your software data set and paper PIDs, even if your repository says that they're optional. And that's really important, actually. So here's an example from Zenodo, um, uh, which is the, uh, uh, actually, most of the Pitapalooza presentations, by the way, are available uh, from Zenodo. Um, and Zenodo automatically assigns, um, you do have an option to 
to provide your own DOI, but otherwise it will assign a DOI for you, for your um, grey literature or other things that you upload there. And when you upload, you can list related identifiers. And that's actually really important because, for example, if you have an article um, and you mint that uh, uh, and you have a data set and each there's a DOI for an article, DOI for the data set, when you mint the DOI for the data set with a data site, you can actually put in the link to the article in the in the uh, metadata that you provide to data site to mint the DOI. And they use that and it's used globally to be able to link this data with this article. So it's actually really widely um, applicable. And uh, even though there are minimal fields and you don't have to do that, it's actually really important if you can tell your PIDs about your other PIDs. You can also share your PIDs with the community um, so, uh, you know, uh, sharing them through depositing metadata, as I mentioned, with data site. There's a, a link here to the event data hub, which is uh, produced by Crossref and data site. And uh, that is a lot about the relationships between objects that they have in common. So the data and the articles and mentions of those things in social media and so forth and include some of those fields. Um, so to get to that rich PID graph, um, we need to have the relationships with the, between things clear. So when you put in um, the metadata for minting a persistent identifier, you want to um, include the relationship. So is referenced by or is supplement to is the example there on the screen. And you can join the PID forum. So if you don't know about PID forum, it is um, a platform where you can talk to other PIDs nerds, um, PIDs experts, PID enthusiasts, whatever you would like to call them from around the world. You can um, pop in your questions, your comments, um, conundrums, anything you want to talk about. Um, that's PID related, the PID forum is the place to go. And I definitely have found it very a very good way to engage with the community. Um, for example, our community in Australia has been looking at PIDs for instruments and some of the questions around PIDs for facilities, research facilities. Um, so getting in there and saying, what has everyone else done globally around this? Um, you know, are there common problems that we are having? How can we tackle this together? PID forums, a way to do that. Um, and I believe from memory, there's also a PIDs 101 uh, or noobs part of the PID forum as well, where you can post any question and please don't be embarrassed. Just ask a question um, because we've all been there and we've all learnt from the ground up. So please feel welcome to join that community. And that actually brings me to the end so um, we are now into the question time. Great stuff. Thank you so much, Natasha. We've got a question here from Toby. Um, is it anticipated that each type of thing on that graph will have a different type of PID? Uh, no, it isn't, Toby. Um, so you don't have to have one type of PID. So the, it, it depends how the PID graph is built. So I mentioned the Freya PID graph, but there are other PID graphs internationally as well. For example, Open Air in Europe has have their own PID graph um, and you can uh, program it to look at other types of identifiers. So, you know, it can look for a URL, not just a DOI, for example. Um, however, it is useful if you are, you know, using... Uh, you know, DOIs or could some of the more um, common PIDs, I would say, but it, you don't have to do it that way. Um, and in fact, I, uh, you know, I think we're quite a long way from achieving everybody assigning DOIs and ORCIDs, et cetera, to everything. So um, we need to make allowances for that in PID graph. That's my answer to that. I don't know if any, any of the other PIDs nerds want to chime in on discussion to answer, answer that. Were there other questions, Siobhan? No, there's no other questions there, but I wonder if we've got any to come from the floor. Going once, going <laughs> twice, going three times, like the letters in PID, <laughs> and we're done there. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, if you do have any questions that arise out of this discussion, you can pop onto Slack and just ask, you know, just pop something in the general Slack and ask 
ask a question or, um, you know, after Pitapalooza, feel free to jump onto Pit Forum and ask those questions. But thank you very much for coming to the session and we hope you enjoy the rest of Pitapalooza um, as it will keep rolling through. So uh, shall we pop out and give people a little bit of a break? Thanks, Jen, for clap. Um, <laughs> going, going, going. Yes, Todd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we might, um, yeah, so perhaps we give people a five-minute break to go to the bathroom before the next uh, session starts on the half hour. Yeah. That sounds Thanks, good. John. Enjoy the rest. It's uh, over to us to to champion Pitapalooza from here. Um, thanks for everything and